in the skies above North Korea, a new kind of air war is raging at 500 miles per hour. Jet versus jet, dogfighting for the first time in history. At the knife edge of the speed of sound, life or death is decided in fractions of a second. Now you're in the cockpit as American pilots pit their F-86 Sabres against communist MiG-15s, redefining air combat in pursuit of a previously unknown glory, the title of Jet Ace. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights. May 20th, 1951, American F-86 Sabre jets ripped through enemy airspace above Sinuiju, North Korea at over 500 miles per hour. Their objective is simple, lure enemy MiGs into a fight and kill as many as possible. These pilots are pioneers of a new age. Air combat is now driven by the jet engine. These guys went into a very unknown environment. They went into a very tough war. This wasn't World War II. They took airplanes that were flying at twice the speed of any fighter combat before, and they showed us how it was done. James Jabara flies element lead in a flight of six. The 27-year-old captain is one of the best, a Mustang pilot during World War II. He's become a master of jet versus jet combat. With four MiG-15 kills to his credit, he's one away from becoming the first American ace of the jet age. Jabara is so close. I mean, he's got four MiG kills. The Air Force desperately wants an ace, and he's the guy that can do it. After only minutes in enemy territory, he'll get his chance. 50 gleaming MiG-15s scream across the Yalu River to take on the Americans. Jabara punches his tanks to streamline his fighter for combat, but something goes wrong. He loses only one of his tanks, gets a, a, a huge asymmetric uh, rocking motion on the aircraft, probably bangs his head off the canopy, has a difficult time controlling the airplane. The pins securing the tanks to the wing have frozen, a common problem in the frigid skies of North Korea. Standing orders dictate that he must return to base. He puts both hands on the stick, steadies it, and gets the aircraft back under control, and then in a very uh, short amount of time has to make that critical combat decision. Can I still fight with this airplane? Now, his judgment is weighed with his aggressiveness, and his aggressiveness wins out. Jabara and the rest of the Americans pull a right break into the oncoming enemy. Approaching head-on, the fighters close at over 1,600 feet per second. At this speed, it's next to impossible to get an accurate shot. The MiGs thunder past. Jabara jerks the stick hard left to pursue. The hung wing tank turns his F-86 into a bucking Bronco. He's probably pulling 30, 40, 50 pounds of stick force right there and trying to control his jet as he's pulling lead out in front. Jabara's wingman, Salvatore Kemp, calls out three more MiGs diving fast from behind. The MiGs are here. They've gained a 100 mile per hour speed advantage in the dive. Jabara and Kemp are here, with only a split second to counter them. The MiGs hurtle in. Jabara pulls up and to the right. He's using the MiGs diving speed against them, forcing an overshoot. Jabara's brake turn up to the right 
forces two MIGs to go right by and continue to go. One MIG, for one reason or another, decides to peel off to the left, exposing his belly to Jabara. Jabara pounces. He snaps his plane to the left and locks onto Tail and Charlie. Not only is that the sign of a good fighter pilot, but it's a sign of a good fighter pilot in the new jet age. Things happen extremely fast, and those that are able to react almost before it happens are able to take advantage. The bandit stays in a diving left turn. Jabara pulls the stick in tight to stay in trail. At this altitude, the F-86 and MiG-15 are evenly matched in a turning fight. But Jabara's got something his foe lacks, a G-suit. It's a World War II invention that came into its own as an essential tool of dogfighting in the jet age. The G-suit constricts around Jabara's legs and abdomen, keeping blood from pooling in his extremities. Jabara is able to pull tighter than the MiG pilot without blacking out. He closes the gap. His coveted fifth kill is now in perfect position, dead center in his gun sight. Jabara opens fire. 50 caliber rounds impact the MiG. The pilot ejects. Seconds later, the empty fuselage explodes. This is what he's been working for. This is why he's been in Korea. So he has got to be elated at this point. It's a confirmed kill. America has its first jet ace. James Jabara honed his skills in the prop-driven fighters of World War II. After the war, he became one of the first American pilots to fly the next generation of combat aircraft, the jet fighter. In a turbojet engine, air enters an intake and is compressed into a combustion chamber where fuel is added and ignited. The rapidly expanding gas forces its way through a turbine and out the exhaust port, creating a massive amount of forward thrust. The jet engine was pioneered by British and German engineers during World War II. In the waning months of the war, the Germans were the first to send a jet fighter into combat, the ME-262. Twin turbojet engines gave it a 100 mile per hour speed advantage over prop fighters. The ME-262 combined jet technology with an innovative swept wing design. The swept wing created less drag than a conventional straight wing, allowing for higher top speeds. During the war years, both the Russians and Americans developed their own first generation jet fighters the MiG-9 and the P-59 era Comet. But these underpowered straight wing designs never saw combat. In 1947, when German technology became available, both the Americans and the Russians adapted the swept wing. The result was the F-86 Sabre and the MiG-15. The F-86 had exceptional visibility and a strong airframe designed for air-to-air -air combat. The MiG was lighter, with a faster rate of climb and a higher service ceiling. In the skies above North Korea, these fighters would square off in the first large-scale jet versus jet dogfights in history. May 20th, 1951. After six months of high-speed air combat, James Jabara has just become America's first jet ace. But a massive air battle is still raging above him. There was never an inclination in his mind to break off and go home just because he made ace. Uh, his job in Korea 
was to kill Miggs. Jabara coaxes his saber to 20,000 feet. His wingman is nowhere in sight. With a hung tank and nobody watching his six, he has two strikes against him. There's a swirl of activity. There are, there are, there are MiGs, there are sabers in the air. He looks forward and he sees six MiGs in the air above him. He immediately goes in the attack mode, just as you would expect him to. And he immediately goes for the trail aircraft, which is the smart thing to do, to pick them off one by one from behind. Jabara's gun forts are blazing. The MiG formation scatters, but number six climbs straight ahead. Jim was uh, trying to close the gap, but of course uh, uh, the F-86 uh, was slower than the MiG in a climb to begin with. With the hung tank, it was very slow, and this MiG could have easily gotten away. But the MiG pilot makes a critical mistake and suddenly dives to the left. The maneuver plays right into the Sabre's strength. It's faster in a dive. Jabara draws a bead and pulls the trigger, shredding his enemy's engine. The powerless jet tumbles, his sixth kill. Suddenly, tracer fire envelops Jabara's canopy. The tables have turned. MiGs are on his six o'clock, closing in to avenge their fallen comrade. Well, now Jabara has committed a couple of cardinal sins. Don't engage if you can't drop your tank. Don't engage if you don't have a wingman. Don't fixate on the target. And that's exactly what he's done in this case. James Jabara realizes that his quest to become a jet ace could cost him his life. May 20th, 1951. Captain James Jabara is running for his life from two MiG-15s. He pulls hard to the left, attempting to throw his attackers off. Glowing 37 and 23 millimeter tracers smoke past the right side of his F-86. Jabara pushes his J-47 jet engine to full power. 5,200 pounds of thrust. But the hung wing tank limits his speed to 500 miles per hour. 100 miles per hour less than the MiGs. What's worse, it handicaps his turning ability. With that tank and the slower speed, Jim was a sitting duck. He pulls hard, hits his speed brakes, pulls his speed brakes in, reverses, turns hard the other way, rolls out, accelerates turns, doing this just to momentarily break up the gun firing solution from the mix. The enemy pilots are padlocked on his tail. He is meat on the table. And unless something happens, Jabara's sixth kill will be his last kill. Luckily for Jabara, something does happen. American pilots Mo Pitts and Rudy Holler happen upon the scene. The Sabres are here. The MiGs are here, behind Jabara. The Americans will dive quickly to close the gap and knock the MiGs off Jabara's tail. At jet speeds, they'll have mere seconds to accomplish their goal. Pitts and Holly roll in behind the MiGs. One of the MiGs pulls off. But the flight leader MiG is not so eager to get out of there. MiG leader lines up his shot, but Holly is in position. His M3 machine guns roar to life. The MiG smokes, breaks for home. The American slashing attack has worked. 
Pitts and Holly form up with Jabara and escort him home. As Jabara taxis in, he finds a crowd waiting for him. It was a great day. We had our first jet ace, and we had a big celebration on the ramp, carried him around. Jabara is awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross. After his 123rd mission, he is sent home to a hero's welcome. He returns to Korea in 1953 and adds an astonishing nine more MiG kills to his tally, becoming one of only two triple aces during the war. Jabara was the first jet ace that the US Air Force had. And this was a, a major triumph and a major accomplishment. He would be the first of many during that war. And he led the way. Jabara's historic achievement sets the bar for every American fighter pilot in Korea. With each new fighter sweep, Sabre pilots clamor for enemy encounters. They can't be the first jet ace, but with a little luck, they can be the second. First Lieutenant Hoot Gibson is one of these men. I could hardly wait. I was ready to go fight. I trained for six years to do this. June 18, 1951. Less than one month after James Jabara's ace-making encounter, First Lieutenant Hoot Gibson heads into North Korea on combat air patrol. The confident 26-year-old pilot has yet to be credited with a confirmed kill, but he's aggressive and has superb mastery of jet combat tactics. I had a lot of fighter time and a lot of experience simulating dogfighting. We thought we could we could whip anything, anybody in any airplane. Heading west toward the China Sea, Gibson spots glints at 3 o'clock high, MiGs. Gibson is here with a formation of 18 American Sabres. 50 MiGs are here, 3,000 feet above at 3 o'clock. The MiG's higher service ceiling means they can choose when and where they want to fight. Outnumbering the Sabres nearly three to one, the MiG's dive in. The Americans turn to engage the enemy head on. Gibson throttles up. His Sabre covers one mile every seven seconds. The jets merge in the blink of an eye. I started climbing right turn to try to be above them and maneuver to the rear of them. Hoot and his wingman swing in behind the enemy formation and single out a straggling MiG. The MiG breaks hard to the left. Gibson maintains track and centers his Sabre's A1C radar ranging gun sight. A radar unit in the nose calculates the distance, and the gun sight determines the necessary lead to put rounds on target. Gibson pulls the trigger. With each burst, 60 50 caliber rounds tear into the enemy jet. The MiG pilot tightens his turn and dives toward the deck, trying to throw off Gibson's aim. They had their nose below the horizon, and I was behind them, but I was on the inside of the turn, and they were turning about two to three degrees, and I couldn't quite stay with them. Straining at over five Gs, Gibson is pulling so hard that he can't keep an angle on his target. The MiG drifts out of his gun sight. Gibson's wingman, Jim Heckman, has a better angle on the enemy. My wingman was in position to take him, so I told him to go ahead and shoot at him, and he did. Heckman scores devastating hits, 
but Gibson must do something to regain a firing angle. He'll call on a tried and true air combat maneuver, the barrel roll. He'll pitch up, roll around his wingman, and position himself on the outside. He's not only out of his wingman's bullets, but he is also putting himself back in, in position to take another shot without hitting his wingman. I maneuvered in behind them and got a good burst on him. And then he projected. One down. But since Heckman scored the most damage, he'll get the credit made the right choice, the instinctive maneuver, to stop his downrange travel, roll back into another firing solution while giving his wingman the shot, and then also the wingman got the kill. That's a hell of a guy. With so many MiGs in the sky, it takes only seconds for Hoot to tally a new target. Another pair of MiGs, 2,000 feet below at 2 o'clock. Easy pickings. But Gibson's gun sight suddenly goes blank. It was probably dirt in the circuit breaker or something. I just reset it with my hand, but it wouldn't reset. It kept popping out. No guts, no glory. Gun sight or no gun sight, Hoot Gibson is going on the attack. June 18, 1951. In a wild jet versus jet dogfight, F-86 pilot Hoot Gibson has seen one MiG-15 go down in flames. He's now in position to attack two more. The enemy jets are here. Gibson and his wingman are here. He has two options. He can nose down into a dive, but he may overshoot. His best option is to barrel roll. The maneuver will put him squarely on the MiG's tail. Gibson pitches up, applying right rudder and aileron. So as they roll over and lose altitude and roll back down in front of the MiG's, they're in perfect firing position. Hoot rolls wings level with two MiG's at his 12 o'clock. The enemy jets pitch up. The lighter MiGs can climb faster than the Sabres. Gibson must act quickly before they get away. I didn't have a gun sight anymore, so I had to stay close, and I'd say four or 500 feet, and I put the airplane in my windscreen at about where I thought the pipper would be. This guy's a good shot. He doesn't necessarily need a radar in order to be able to figure out what the range is. He knows from his experience how big that MiG looks in his windscreen to be at the range where he wants to fire. Hoot fires two dead center bursts into the communist jet. The MiG pilot ejects as his entire right wing rips off. It's Gibson's first official kill. As the enemy plane spirals from view, Hoot catches sight of his commanding officer, Lieutenant Colonel Ben Emmert, below him at his two o'clock. He's chasing a MiG, but he's not alone. There's another MiG on his tail, closing in for the kill. He had tunnel vision for that MiG, and I called him and told him I had a MiG, a MiG was on his tail, but I would be able to take care of him. Hoot acts quickly. Yet again, he barrel rolls to the right. Gibson levels out with the MiG dead ahead. The MiG spots Gibson and jinks violently in a desperate attempt to shake his pursuer. He turned to the left and maybe lowered the nose three or four degrees, 
below the horizon. And I stayed right with him. He turned back to the right, and he just helped me stay in position. And I got two more good bursts into him. The MiG bursts into flames. At 3,000 feet, the jet explodes. In a matter of minutes, Hoot Gibson has seen three MiGs downed, scoring two confirmed kills for himself, putting him in the running to become America's next jet ace. He claims his third kill three weeks later on July 11th, his fourth on September 2nd, and on September 9th, 1951, Gibson downs a fifth, realizing his dream of becoming a jet ace. But the kill comes just minutes after Captain Dick Becker shoots down his fifth MiG. Officially, Becker is credited as the second jet ace. Hoot Gibson is the third. I felt good. That's what we were supposed to be doing. And I felt like that we were getting payback for all the training I'd been given. The early jet aces used the same principles of air combat developed for piston engine fighters of World War II. But techniques and tactics had to adapt to the new realities of high altitude, high speed jet combat. Fuel management became the overriding consideration in Korean War jet combat. Instead of the large squadron sized formations of World War II, it was determined that flights of four sabers continuously streaming in and out of the combat zone was the most efficient use of resources. This necessitated strict adherence to flight integrity and keeping the basic finger four formation intact. At jet speeds, any sudden maneuver could easily split a flight of four or cause a lead to be separated from his wingman. An American fighter left alone was vulnerable. The rule was, singles go south. Just weeks before the air war ends, 28-year-old Captain Ralph Parr will face this danger firsthand in one of the most harrowing dogfights of the new jet age. June 7, 1953, 20 miles south of the Yalu River, Sabres of the 335th Fighter Squadron soar at 43,000 feet, hunting for enemy aircraft. Second Lieutenant Al Cox is element lead. On Cox's wing is Captain Ralph Parr. The weather was absolutely beautiful. If it had been just slightly clearer and you could have got slightly higher, you could have seen Paris, so the visibility was so good but the stillness is shattered in an instant. A flight of MiGs bounces them from nine o'clock high. Parr spots the attackers and calls a left break, but the lead element breaks right. In an instant, flight integrity is compromised. Flight lead orders Cox and Parr to withdraw and form up. Parr keeps his eyes peeled. As I was sweeping with my eyes to the lower right, I spotted a movement against the uh, coloration of the ground. I called it out as a bogey, and Cox came right back and he says, I don't have it. You've got, you take it, I've got you covered. The MiG is heading in the opposite direction, far below him at treetop level. It's Parr's first chance for a kill. He wings over to intercept the MiG with a split S. In the maneuver, Parr will dive, reverse direction, and drop in behind the MiG. The speed his jet builds in the dive will easily allow him to close the distance on his enemy. Parr snaps his plane over and firewalls the throttle. 
The move is so sudden that Cox doesn't see where Parr is headed. He called me and he said, I've lost you. Which way did you go? I said, I went straight down. Come on down, see if you can find me. He rapidly accelerates past 670 miles per hour, cracking the sound barrier. It's not uncommon for the Saber to pass Mach 1 in a dive, but its flight controls are ill-equipped to deal with these speeds. The F-86 came around in an era when we were breaking the sound barrier and understanding transonics and what went on with airplanes when they did go supersonic. And in a dive approaching supersonic speeds, the flight control uh, surfaces will be far less responsive. And it may be not possible to uh, recover from a dive. Parr knows that the Sabre needs 14,500 feet to pull out of a vertical dive. But he's already dropped below 10,000 feet. In the new jet age, things just get away from you. The speed builds up, and there's no way you can dissipate it because you don't have the aircraft controllability to slow your airplane down at that point. Even with idle boards, he's rocketing this jet at the ground at roughly 600 knots, 700 miles an hour, roughly. And he's there, and he's, he's about to die. June 7, 1953. Captain Ralph Parr is diving towards a MiG-15 that is hugging the treetops. Parr's biggest concern isn't the bandit, but terra firma rushing up at him at 1,000 feet per second. Self-preservation is now the only thing that matters. Parr pulls back on the stick, hard. He grunts like a weightlifter to keep from blacking out. The pull of nine times the force of gravity instantly inflates the G-suit, gripping his abdomen and legs. For a moment, his body weighs 1,400 pounds. I suddenly realized, breathe. You're not breathing. Well, the reason I wasn't breathing is my G-suit had swollen up due to the G-load in the pullout, and I couldn't get any air in my own lungs. The horizon slowly slides into view outside his windscreen. Parr is alive by only inches. He's probably bent the airplane, but he's still flying. The MiG is now directly in front of him, still hugging the ground. Parr is gaining rapidly. Then, a shattering realization. I look straight ahead and I could see one aircraft. Within a split second, I could see two, I could see four. The four multiplied into another four, and then the other four multiplied into another eight. Parr discovers that there are 16 bandits off his nose. He's on his own. The usual tactics don't apply. He'll rely on skill and pure guts to get out of this alive. He singles out the leader of the eight MiGs out in front. I'm gonna take the lead aircraft because he's got the most experience and cut the Indians loose rather than the other way around. Still carrying a 100 mile per hour speed advantage from his hair raising dive, Parr closes quickly within 3,000 feet, gun range. He squeezes the trigger. The MiGs scatter. The MiG leader lifts his nose and breaks hard right. Parr throws the stick over to stay with him. With the onset of G, the speed, it's a very athletic endeavor to get yourself into a dogfight. To go from weighing 190 pounds to 1,300 pounds in a split second and, and having that 1,300 pounds of weight on you for 30 seconds is unbelievable. Parr strains to keep his head upright and eyes outside. I was somewhere between nine, nine and a half Gs and my, my light on my gun sight, the reticle and the pipper, disappeared. Either a fuse has blown or a circuit breaker tripped. 
Not surprising, given the abuse thrown at the saber in the last 60 seconds. It was irritating. <laughs> you're expecting to use it, you're depending on, on having it there, and all of a sudden it quits. There's no time to dwell on it. Parr's on the verge of overtaking the MiG. His worst mistake would be to overshoot. He cuts the throttle to idle, pops his speed brakes, and does a half roll to bleed off airspeed. To keep from overshooting him, I came up and left it in close to him. So we wound up pretty much canopy to canopy like this. MiG leader counters Parr's move. He's no slouch. The two silver jets begin an incredible aerial ballet, twisting around each other, barely 500 feet from the ground. It's called a rolling scissors. The object is to bring your guns to bear on your opponent by forcing him to slip out front. The only way to do that is by gradually reducing airspeed to the razor's edge of sustained flight. through his canopy, and I can see his feet. I can even see the laces in his boots. Parr uses stick and rudder with just enough throttle. The MiG does the same. It's energy management in the extreme. Coordination is key. Someone is bound to slip up. It's the MiG pilot. He adds a little too much throttle in the roll and moves ahead of Parr. I thought, friend, that cost you. And I booted outside rudder, outside aileron, and tried to slide in behind him. The next thing that went through my mind is, I'm going to hit him. Parr's heart is about to leap out of his chest. He slides the saber's nose just inches from the MiG's shark-like tail. It's too close for comfort. The F-86 is thumped hard by the MiG's jet wash, a new hazard in the jet age. Parr controls the buffeting saber, reduces power, and backs off. I pulled the trigger, I hit him. He zigged off to one side, and I latched onto him, climbed into the saddle. But MiG leader is not about to throw in the towel. He rolled underneath, which caught me totally by surprise. I hadn't anticipated that at all. The MiG snap rolls to quickly change direction, attempting to regain the advantage and use his jet wash to keep Parr at bay. Parr stays on him like glue, but he must avoid the MiG's exhaust. The hot blast could flip the saber at any moment. And as low as they are, there's no room to recover. But Ralph Parr is not about to give up now. June 7, 1953. F-86 Sabre pilot Ralph Parr is in hot pursuit of a MiG-15. Literally. The MiG has already forced him into a death-defying role. As I was following him, he started to uh, do it again. And this time, I thought, you're not going to catch me on that. Parr will pitch up and roll over the top. It's a bold move that will put him in firing position and clear of the MiG's jet wash. I went over the top, and I was sitting there waiting on him when he came out of the tucking it under, and he was right in front of me. Then I let him have it. The MiG lights up like a Roman candle. After an exhausting contest, Parr tastes victory for the first time. But there's no time to gloat. A quick glance over his left shoulder, more 
Miggs diving on him from 8 o'clock. Parr adds power while snapping the stick hard left. The Sabre responds instantly. Orange tracers drift menacingly close to his tail. The MiGs try to stay with him, but they're too fast. The first MiG overshoots, followed by the second and the third. But the number four MiG stays in trail. The experienced Sabre pilot senses his enemy is about to bug out. He got disheartened a little bit, and he didn't think he was going to make it. If he can trick the MiG and draw it in closer, Barr can force an overshoot and then go on the attack. What I had to do then was to back off on my turn to make it easier for him to get a shot at me. Parr widens his turn, allowing the MiG to think he has a chance. The MiG pilot takes the bait and maneuvers for a shot. Parr will wait until the last second, then load up and increase his turn rate. If the MiG overshoots, Parr will be able to reverse his turn and drop in on the MiG's tail. The MiG begins pulling lead. Parr pulls the stick back, adding power and throwing in more aileron. The MiG flashes by. Parr reverses, rolling in behind his target. Then I took the tracers and just very slowly walked them up through his airplane. Splash two for Ralph Parr. But almost instantly, another MiG streaks in, cannon blazing. Again, Parr puts the Sabre into a crushing turn to force another overshoot. The MiG-15 screams past him, too fast to engage. The MiG climbs to rejoin his comrades. They've had enough. During eight sweat-drenched minutes of jet-on-jet -jet combat, Ralph Parr has engaged 16 MiGs and shot down two. This won't be Ralph Parr's last encounter with the enemy in MiG Alley. He scores eight more kills in record time, proving himself to be one of the most aggressive fighter pilots in US Air Force history. Parr joins James Jabara as one of only 11 pilots to claim 10 or more victories over Korea. The jet aces of the Korean War were the pioneers of the sky. They were a very much a no excuses bunch, and they showed us the way. They provided us with some tremendous uplifting victories in that war. These are the guys that have mastered the speed, the, the, the new dogfight. They've used tactics of old, but they're doing it at breakneck speed. In the crucible of air combat over Korea, these elite few fought the battles and wrote the textbook on jet versus jet warfare. Many of these veteran pilots stayed in the cockpit to take the next generation of jet fighters to war, shattering the sound barrier above Southeast Asia and ushering in the missile age. The modern era of air warfare was born, owing to the intrepid young aviators who stared down a communist onslaught and won. The legacy 
of the Jet Aces. Machine gun fire rips through the fuselage. Flames fill the cockpit. The aircraft plummets in a wild spin. But time and again, the pilot of a P-47 Thunderbolt pulls out and keeps on fighting. Over occupied Europe, the Thunderbolt blazed a reputation as the most rugged fighter of World War II, sending nearly 4,000 enemy aircraft down in flames. Now, you're in the cockpit as the P-47 takes on swarms of Nazi fighters. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights of the Thunderbolt. June 26, 1943. 48 P-47 Thunderbolts of the 56th Fighter Group breached the airspace of occupied France over Le Treport. Their mission, protect B-17 bombers on their return trip to England. A young fighter pilot named Robert S. Johnson flies Blue 4 at the tail end of the formation. Like many of the 56th, he's new to combat. Robert S. Johnson was among the earliest pilots assigned to the 56th group. He entered combat uh, flying his first missions in the spring of 1943. 15 miles inland, Johnson spots something at 5 o'clock high. The tiny specks are directly behind him. It's a formation of 16 Focke-Wulf 190s, Germany's most heavily armed single-engine fighter. Adrenaline surges. The young pilot calls out the bandits over the radio. The Germans draw closer. Johnson tries the radio again. But before he completes the transmission, the enemy is upon him. just about shot him to pieces. His canopy was perforated. He had an explosive shell explode nearby. It left steel shards in his leg. Metal is ripped. Plexiglass shatters. A machine gun bullet grazes the tip of his nose. Johnson's P-47 plummets from 20,000 feet, spinning out of control. The aircraft shudders and screams. Flames lick exposed skin and swirl inside the cockpit. Most of his instruments were destroyed or damaged. And at that point, Johnson said that he was pretty much resigned to dying. Johnson kicks left rudder to level the wings and pulls back on the stick. Incredibly, the aircraft pulls out of its death spiral, but it may not stay airborne for long. The canopy would only open about six inches and it jammed. He can't get out of the aircraft. Johnson tries to force it open, bracing his feet on the instrument panel. Nothing. He stands, trying to squeeze through the broken canopy frame, but his parachute snags. He began to uh, take stock of the situation. He noticed that the smoke had abated in the cockpit. The fire had gone out from the engine. Through blood-reddened eyes, Johnson scans the skies for any sign of friendly aircraft. He's completely 
completely alone. Again, he tries to pound the canopy frame loose. Nothing. The Thunderbolt may prove to be his coffin. He's in a, a glide at that point, slowly losing altitude, but still up there pretty good. And he can't get out of the aircraft. Then, at his 4 o'clock, a single aircraft comes into view. It's a yellow-nosed Hawk Wolf 190. His heart sinks. He was intercepted by the German ace, Egon Meyer, who by then had three and a half years of combat and with 66 kills to his credit as of that date, Meyer was a potent, deadly adversary. Egon Meyer closes in for an easy kill. Robert Johnson's only hope for survival rests with his plane. The Thunderbolt's reputation for ruggedness will be put to the test as never before. The Republic P-47 Thunderbolt was first introduced to the United States Army Air Corps in 1942. The new fighter was designed as an interceptor, meant to strike enemy bombers at high altitude. It was the largest, most powerful single-engine, single-seat plane built by the Allied forces during the war. The P-47 was equipped with one of the iconic aircraft engines of the war, the Pratt & Whitney R-2800, an 18-cylinder radial that pumped out 2,000 horsepower. Wedded to the powerful engine was a turbocharger which gave the P-47 excellent performance at high altitude. The uh, turbo supercharger compresses the ambient air at a given altitude and essentially uh, fools the engine into thinking that it's in a lower altitude because of the denser air being ingested into the engine. And that in turn yields greater power proportionate to what would normally be possible in the thinner air up around 25 or 30,000 feet. The airframe was built around the massive engine and the associated ducting required for the turbocharger. Of necessity, this had to be run underneath the engine, which gave the P-47 its characteristic shape and impressive size. They nicknamed it the jug because of its characteristic milk jug profile. If you were to turn it on its end, on its nose, it looked like a jug. The Thunderbolt was built like a tank. Because it's so big, you feel this presence of this large, voracious fighting machine. It really does inspire confidence in a pilot. The Thunderbolt made an ideal gun platform, and so it was equipped with eight 50 caliber machine guns, four in each wing. Eight 50 caliber machine guns was as heavy an armament as any World War II fighter ever had. Fully loaded for combat, the Thunderbolt could weigh over eight tons. The B-47 entered combat over Europe in the spring of 1943. As pilots flew the new fighter into harm's way, one singular quality distinguished it from all others, ruggedness. Its radial engine could take more punishment than an inline, seeing as it wasn't water-cooled, where a bullet in the right place and the radiator could put the engine out, P-47s could lose a cylinder and still come back. Three-eighths inch armor plates around the cockpit, a sturdy airframe, and self-sealing fuel tanks all contributed to making the Jug the most durable fighter of World War II. On June 23, 1943, Pilot Robert Johnson's life depends on the Jug's ability to absorb punishment. A single Fock Wolf 190 has spotted the wounded Thunderbolt. German ace Egon Meyer maneuvers confidently onto Johnson's six o'clock. He cannot get out of the way. He cannot outrun it. He is at the mercy of an enemy who almost surely has no mercy in him. In a futile attempt to postpone the inevitable, Johnson banks to the right. 
the 190 easily keeps pace. Johnson is helpless. The FW-190's nose lights up as Meyer squeezes the trigger. A hail of 7.9 millimeter machine gun bullets pummel the jug. The din is overpowering. Johnson's only defensive maneuver is to alternately hit the rudder pedals to throw off the German's aim. The move causes Meyer to overshoot. For a fleeting moment, Johnson has the upper hand. He fires a burst from his 50 cals. I can't really see him. The canopy's covered with oil and hydraulic fluid all over the place. He's got fluid in his eyes. His eyes are burning. But it made him feel good that he could just fire off a couple rounds and show that German pilot that, hey, I can still fight a little bit. Meyer continues a long, slow circle. Johnson can only watch. The 190 effortlessly banks in behind him. But to Johnson's amazement, the 190 pulls up on his wing. Johnson figured that at that point, well, maybe this German is out of ammunition and he's just looking me over. Egon Meyer eyes the battered jug, shakes his head in disbelief, then acknowledges the American pilot with a wave. Bob gave a sigh of relief. He said, OK, the German's letting me go. But Meyer doesn't break off. Johnson realized, oh my god, he's not finished with me yet. The P-47 is punished by another rain of lead. Robert S. Johnson hunches his shoulders inside the armor plate behind his back, praying the Thunderbolt will hold out against the relentless assault. June 26, 1943. Robert S. Johnson's defenseless P-47 has withstood repeated attacks by German FW-190 ace Egon Meyer. Johnson, already wounded and disoriented from another FW encounter, is alone and at the mercy of the German ace. The Thunderbolt shudders under the impact of another burst. Incredulous, Meyer pulls up on Johnson's wing for a second time. The German is determined to finish him off. just starts raking him over, and the German pilot starts generally hitting his rudder, so he's raking 30 caliber fire from wingtip to wingtip. But the designers at Republic had done their job well. The airplane's sturdy aluminum and steel framework shrugs off yet a third salvo. The Fock Wolf again pulls abreast of the Thunderbolt. The German finally really, no kidding, was out of ammunition. Meyer, a top German ace, has been denied his 67th kill. He rocks his wings in salute and banks away. The sky is once again empty as Johnson nurses the battered P-47 over the English Channel. The Thunderbolt is carrying him home. But when he landed the plane, he started counting the bullet holes. By the time he reached 200 without even moving around the aircraft, he gave up. Robert S. Johnson went on to become America's second highest scoring ace of the European theater, with 27 kills in the P-47 Thunderbolt. The winter of 1943 saw waves of B-17s and B-24s beginning to thrust deep into fortress Europe. But the fuel-hungry P-47 lacked the range to escort the bombers all the way to their targets. The Thunderbolt's duties as a bomber escort were slowly taken over by the more fuel-efficient P-51 Mustang.
With the addition of the Rolls-Royce Merlin inline engine, the P-51 Mustang gained the reputation as America's quintessential dogfighter. The P-51 was a sleek thoroughbred racehorse compared to the P-47's draft horse stamina and brute strength. So in the lead up to the Normandy invasion, a new mission was envisioned for the Thunderbolt. Its ruggedness and heavy armament made it ideal for strafing and dive bombing. The P-47 became the dominant fighter of the 9th Air Force, primarily because it was such an extremely versatile and effective ground attack airplane. Thunderbolt pilots of the 9th Air Force were seldom called on to dogfight. But if attacked, they were more than ready. June 14, 1944, P-47s of the 368th Fighter Group climbed to altitude after attacking German ground positions. 21-year-old Lieutenant George Sutcliffe forms up on his squadron commander, Colonel John Hessler. They are RTB, returned to base. Sutcliffe, his head on a swivel, is the first to spot the danger lurking above. I turned back to take a look. Uh, out of the clouds came a whole gaggle, they call them, a bunch of black things. <clears throat> I thought it looked like a bunch of rats coming out of the, out of the clouds in back of us. No less than 40 ME-109s are descending on the four Thunderbolts. Squadron commander is still on the radio, talking to us about looking for targets. He's yakking away, and these I mean, 109s are coming up on us pretty quickly. I'm hollering to the uh, squadron commander. I say, break left, Colonel, break left. The ME-109s open fire just as Sutcliffe's frantic calls get through. When he heard me, he broke. He pulled up. I pulled up with him. The Thunderbolts are split up in the frenzy. Sutcliffe squeezes off a burst as a German moves through his windscreen. Some of his 50 caliber rounds strike home. The squadron commander hollered, uh, there's too damn many of these guys. Let's get out of here. Get in the clouds. He had a paddle prop, which was the latest. And the paddle prop was really a benefit in climbing. The wider paddle propeller scoops more air with each rotation, improving the jug's rate of climb. John Hessler and element lead Marv Rossville easily reach the clouds, but George Sutcliffe and Robert Bechtel are left behind. The two Americans are vastly outnumbered. Two jugs versus 40 ME-109s. The ME-109 was the most produced fighter of the war. It was equipped with two 13-millimeter machine guns and one 20-millimeter cannon mounted in the prop hub. The ME-109 turns better, but the P-47 is tougher and heavier, giving it the edge in a dive, but making it slower than the 109 in a climb. Sutcliffe is here. There are too many 109s on all sides of him to make a break for the clouds. He'll try to blast out of the furball and dive for safety. I figured I'm gonna need everything I've got here. I just pushed the throttle and I hit the button for the water injection. And that plane just took right off. It was, it, it was moving pretty good. Water injection was widely used during World War II a limited quantity of water methanol mixture could be injected into the engine cylinders for cooling purposes. The jug's engine howls as he barrels through the furball. I just put my head down. I got down in the cockpit to make myself as small a target as I could. I can remember just peeking over that. Again. I'm going into this bunch of 109. Sutcliffe fires at anything that crosses his flight path. Then pitches down in a steep dive. 
but he can't shake two Messerschmitts that stay on his tail. They were gaining on me. So in my mind, I say, this is stupid. <laughs> I can't get away this way. There's not enough altitude for Sutcliffe to dive away from the ME-109s. His mind races. Someone had indicated that the 109 does not turn as well to the right as it does to the left. I don't know where that came from, but it stuck in my mind. So I started a tight right-hand spiral going up to try to get in the clouds. The tight defensive spiral will prevent the Messerschmitts from putting their gun sights on the Thunderbolt. But Sutcliffe will lose airspeed in the climb, threatening a stall before he reaches the clouds. Sutcliffe pulls hard while hitting right rudder. The Thunderbolt responds smartly. The 109s break off their attack. While in the spiral, Sutcliffe spots the only other jug still in the fight, Robert Bechtold. I saw him, he had a 109 on his tail, and he was getting hit pretty good. And he started to burn, and he bailed out. Now alone and close to stalling, Sutcliffe releases back pressure and levels the wings. There are 20 Messerschmitts orbiting 1,500 feet above him, preventing his run for the clouds. They did get organized, and they had two what we call Luffberries right under the cloud cover, the bottom of the clouds. The Germans have formed two counter-rotating Luffberry circles at 2,000 feet. If Sutcliffe tries to run in any direction, they can easily dive onto his tail and shoot him down. Sutcliffe knows his options are few. Just didn't have enough power to get that 2,000 feet into the cloud layer. The Germans circle overhead. They're hunting as a pack, waiting for their prey to weaken. A grueling battle is about to unfold. June 14, 1944. P-47 Thunderbolt pilot George Sutcliffe is outnumbered and trapped at low level. At least 20 Messerschmitts are blocking his means of escape, a cloud base at 2,000 feet. As Sutcliffe's mind races through his options, a single ME-109 drops from the Luftberry to make a pass. Sutcliffe is here. The 109 is here. Sutcliffe's best option is to make a sudden snap roll to dive for the deck and throw the 109 off his tail. I waited and waited the last split second. I'm sure he was going to go right through me. <laughs> Sutcliffe rolls. Cannon shells rip into his left wing. I'm going for the deck again, head first, and just and I haven't got far to go. <laughs> the dive builds precious airspeed, energy he can convert to altitude to climb ever closer to the clouds. Hard back on the stick. Under the force of six Gs, he's close to blacking out. It's a little harrowing experience. I couldn't see, but I had, you know, just, I don't know what you call it, you know what you're doing. You're not unconscious. Your blood comes back to your eyes and you're just back to normal. Sutcliffe will use the airspeed he's built up in the dive to enter another climbing spiral that will help throw off the Germans' attack runs while getting him nearer the safety of the clouds. So with these tight spirals, I was going pretty fast at the beginning, but with my node almost straight up in a tight turn, I killed all the aerodynamics, so there was no lift. It was just this beautiful big Pratt & Whitney engine that was pulling me and this seven-ton airplane straight up. To prevent a stall, Sutcliffe is forced to level off. 
the moment where he's most vulnerable to attack. I'm starting to level out, hoping I can get into the clouds. And the 109 came down from the left. He was going too fast. The ME-109 overshoots the turn, then does something completely unexpected. He pulled up and slid right into me, just maybe 25, 30 feet away. It was just like flying formation with me. And I could see him clearly, he could see me clearly. He just looked at me and shook his head, and I looked at him, I shook my head. I took it the fact that he was probably saying, there's no way you're going to get out of here. A moment's silent acknowledgement between two warriors, and the fight continues. He was hanging on a stall just like I was, but he started to just come back a little bit so he could get an angle on me. And just as I saw the nose where I felt he's going to let me have it, I pulled up I went right over his canopy. Sutcliffe's hands and feet are a flurry of coordinated action. Full back on the stick, right aileron and rudder. Yet another attack is foiled. He dives for airspeed and again pulls up into a climbing spiral. Another attempt to reach the clouds. I'm flying the old Thunderbolt, which we call a Razorback. Didn't have a bubble canopy, so it was difficult to see directly in back of you. And all of a sudden, traces come by both sides of my canopy. Sutcliffe is here. Another ME-109 is here, in his blind spot. I yanked the stick, I hit the rudder, and I, I did a, a quick snap roll, and he did hit me with that 20 millimeter. The armor plate behind his headrest deflects the blast. It just gave me a jolt, and I was so hepped up, it didn't make much difference. Sutcliffe is forced away from the clouds and into yet another power dive. He pulls back on the stick, but the controls are sluggish. The jug has taken some serious hits. I'm pulling back, and man, it's just, I'm having a heck of a lot of trouble getting it. So I wrap my leg around it and put two hands on it to get out of that dive. Sutcliffe barely clears the trees. He's exhausted and drenched in sweat. He's been fighting for his life for 15 minutes. Sutcliffe knows this has to end. I figured the next one I might not be able to pull out. So I was just figured that I'm going to have to make a run for it. Sutcliffe begins another climbing spiral. This one will be decisive. It's now or never. I looked around again. I didn't see anybody coming at me, so I leveled off and tried to get in the clouds. I'm probably 1,500 feet. I got another 500 feet to go. Another German 109 drops from the Luftberry to attack. Intent on downing the lone P-47 once and for all. The German streaks in full throttle, building up excess speed in the dive. He chops power and throws in left rudder. The move puts him abreast of Sutcliffe's right wing. He pulled in close to me again as we were going up. When I was so close to the clouds, I wasn't about to make any changes. If he's going to get me, he's going to get me, but I was going to go in the cloud. Sutcliffe's engine howls as he claws for altitude. The 109's machine guns inch closer to the Thunderbolt's vulnerable six. It's an all-out race for the clouds. June 14, 1944. P-47 Thunderbolt pilot George Sutcliffe is racing for the safety of a cloud deck. A German ME-109 inches closer to firing position. Sutcliffe teeters on the edge of stall as the turbocharged 2800 radial pulls the seven-ton jug towards safety. After 18 agonizing minutes, George Sutcliffe finally breaks into the clouds, closely flanked by the ME-109. And when we got up, just covered with the clouds, he, he rolled over. I saw his belly roll over and he went out. So I'm thrilled that I'm in the clouds. 
in an incredible display of airmanship, George Sutcliffe has outflown 20 Germans and lived to tell about it. He wings his thunderbolt towards home. When I came in, they were surprised to see me. They thought I'd been shot down. I got down and got out of the aircraft. I was exhausted. I was just limp. George Sutcliffe's epic fight is a stunning example of the Thunderbolt's defensive capabilities. But the Jug was a dogfighter at heart. And with 850 caliber machine guns, it was more than ready to take the fight to the Germans. December 19, 1944, 16 P-47 Thunderbolts of the 354th Fighter Group cruise into German airspace. Their mission, dive bomb the headquarters of the 116th Panzer Division near Prome. They're led by Captain Kenneth Dahlberg, an ace in the P-51s with 10 kills. He is on his first combat mission in the Thunderbolt. Whereas a lot of the P-47 groups later transitioned to P-51s, the 354th transitioned from a P-51 in late 1944 into P-47s. Dahlberg and his 16 P-47s never arrive at their primary target. They are diverted by ground control to a formation of 30 ME-109s. Dahlberg is here. The ME-109s are here. He will bank left to move in behind the German formation. But as he moves in, Dahlberg spots even more enemy aircraft. 40 ME-109s climbing to join the fight. The Mustang ace is aggressive, confident his dogfighting prowess will translate to the jug. He prepares for combat. So the first thing that happens, the adrenaline goes up. <laughs> we had to get rid of our bombs, so we just jettisoned our bombs. Unseen, the P-47s approach the enemy formation. Dahlberg and his men pick targets. He closes the range and opens fire with his 850 cows. The trailing ME-109 is shredded. The German pilot bails out. The first one to pick off was pretty easy because they were not aware of us. Now they all turn into us, so they were coming right smack at us. So now it's a game of chicken. Dahlberg and his Thunderbolts barrel through the formation. The dogfight quickly escalates into a wild frenzy. The second formation of ME-109s joins the melee. The skies reverberate with the sound of over 80 fighters maneuvering in violent air combat. There's a lot of screaming on the radios and you could hear distress calls. In the midst of the brawl, Dahlberg picks out a target, an ME-109 just out of range in a descending left turn. Dahlberg snaps to the left and gives chase. He squeezes off several bursts, scoring some hits. But the ME-109 is at the extreme range of his guns. All of a sudden, somebody overshot me. The 109 went by me. He's closer than the other guys, so now I, I, change, I change targets. The ME-109 is expertly flown. Dahlberg can't pull lead to get off a clean shot. But the German does something unusual. He takes the fight into the vertical. The 109 will reverse direction and pitch up. 
Dahlberg climbs up as well. The move initiates a vertical rolling scissors. Each plane claws for altitude, hoping his opponent stalls first. If you're going to stay on his tail, you've got to get up and turn around. And he's doing the same thing. So whoever can get the highest without stalling out and get in a position will, will win. Dahlberg's newer model P-47 has an improved engine and a paddle prop. It can match the ME-109 in a climb. They meet at the bottom of the scissors in crushing 5G pullouts. Drive walls start to feel like they're coming out of the sockets, and things get hazy sometimes. But it's the balance of maximizing what the body will stand and survival. Dahlberg fights exhaustion and stays aggressive. He's slowly gaining the advantage. As he begins to climb, he cranks his head up, watching as the German makes his move. But this time, his opponent makes a critical mistake. He's loosened his turn. When he turned for the climb up to turn, I got the profile of his whole airplane. Dahlberg fires. A three-second burst unleashes hundreds of rounds of 50 caliber ammunition. A crushing weight of fire impacts the canopy and cockpit of the ME-109. The German plane drops out of the sky. Kill number two. Dahlberg stays alert and picks out the nearest target. It's the only way to fight in the chaos of a furball. Dahlberg's P-47 is here in a descending right turn. The ME-109 is here, 500 feet below. From his position, Dahlberg can easily drop in on the German's tail. He didn't realize I was there. That was a quickie. Dahlberg deftly leads his target and fires. The ME-109 smokes. The pilot throws the canopy back and leaps for safety. It's kill number three. But immediately, Dahlberg's Thunderbolt is enveloped in tracer fire. The tables have turned in an instant. Dahlberg finds himself in the crosshairs of an ME-109, hell-bent on blowing him out of the sky. December 19, 1944. In the midst of a ferocious 80-plane dogfight, Thunderbolt pilot Ken Dahlberg has scored three victories. But now, an ME-109 has the drop on him. He'll have to shake him loose if he wants to get home to celebrate his victories. At that point, and I had to go from an offensive mood to a defensive mood very fast. Dahlberg breaks right out of the stream of tracers, craning his neck around for a glimpse of his attacker. The 109 is on his tail, beginning to pull lead. Dahlberg calls on an ingenious evasive maneuver, a technique called cross-controlling. The rudder pushes the nose left or right. The ailerons roll the airplane. By ruddering one direction and rolling opposite, the Thunderbolt actually skids sideways, making it extremely difficult for the 109 to land strikes. You kick the right rudder all the way in, and then instead of coordinating the stick with the rudder to the right, you put the stick to the left. You change course very, very rapidly. You start going sideways, so his shells will stay out in front of you then. The attack is foiled. 
but Dahlberg is losing critical energy. He relaxes the skid and drops his nose for airspeed. The ME-109 stays with him, lining up another shot. The German fires. Again, Dahlberg skids out of the stream of bullets. When you have the reality that somebody's on your tail, you take every wild maneuver you can do. Dahlberg tries everything to shake the ME-109 from his tail. The German holds fast. Suddenly, tracer fire envelops the 109. He's forced to break off. Maybe one of my buddies was shooting at him or something. I don't know. There was Everybody was shooting at everybody up there. Dahlberg scans the skies for another ME-109. For the first time in seven minutes, he can't find an immediate target. It seemed like instantly they all almost disappeared. Dahlberg forms up with another Thunderbolt. Together, they scan the horizon. In the distance, they spot two 109s trying to slip away. We both had seen a couple of guys that were just kind of stragglers that were apparently leaving, and we poured the coal to it and caught up. The 109s are at a lower altitude. Dahlberg dives after them, easily building up enough speed to pull within gun range. He fires his eight Brownings for the last time that day. The engine smokes. The German pilot bails out. It's Dahlberg's fourth kill, his 14th of the war. Dahlberg gathers the remaining P-47s and prepares for the flight home. Though outnumbered five to one, they've managed to knock out nine enemy aircraft to the loss of three Thunderbolts. On his first combat mission in a P-47, Ken Dahlberg demonstrates perfectly that in the hands of a skilled pilot, the Thunderbolt was every bit as lethal as the P-51 Mustang. The P-47 Thunderbolt was arguably the most significant fighter of the European theater in World War II. I think it's helpful to remember that the P-47, not the Mustang, was the most produced American fighter of all time. About 15,500 Thunderbolts of all types were built from 1941 through 1945. Thunderbolt pilots downed 3,752 enemy aircraft in air-to-air -air combat. On the ground, they destroyed 86,000 railway cars, 9,000 locomotives, and 6,000 armored fighting vehicles during the war. But time and technology caught up with the B-47. By the Korean War, it was phased out of the American Air Force to make way for fighters of the jet age. The P-47 Thunderbolt's legacy lives on in another superb ground attack aircraft, the A-10. In tribute to the P-47, the A-10 was officially named the Thunderbolt II, but is more commonly known as the Warthog. The A-10 can unleash devastating firepower on enemy ground targets with precision guided munitions and an incredibly lethal 30 millimeter cannon. And like its namesake, the A-10 has a reputation for ruggedness, a reputation that resonates with P-47 Thunderbolt pilots when they think of their old war horse. It was the best airplane that, uh, that I ever flew, particularly going to combat. You just felt that thing was going to bring you home. No matter how much it gets shot up, it was going to bring you home. Kamikaze. A terrifying weapon conceived in desperation.
Japanese pilots committed to an unthinkable mission, a violent end as a human bomb. Now, through startling computer animation, an unprecedented view of these suicide attacks. On deck with horrified American sailors, and inside the kamikaze's cockpits, as suicide airplanes and rockets hurtle towards oblivion. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Kamikaze, next on Dark Bites. October 25th, 1944, 10 a.m. Nine Japanese Zero fighters streak towards Leyte Gulf in the Philippines. The planes fly at wave top level to avoid detection by American radar. Theirs is a special mission, historic yet terrifying. It is the first organized kamikaze attack of World War II. Five of the Zeros carry a 550-pound bomb in place of the usual long-range fuel tank. The extra weight makes them unfit to dogfight. So four other Zeros fly escort. Japanese fighter ace Kunio Iwashita flew similar escort missions for kamikazes. <laughs> I was a fighter pilot, so my job was to accompany the kamikaze forces when they went on a mission and shoot down the Americans if they got in the way. Also, we were supposed to see what sort of results came from the kamikaze attacks, then report what we had seen back to base. Leading the suicide planes is Lieutenant Yukio Seki, his orders are to seek out the ships protecting the Allied invasion force on the Philippines, a small U.S. Navy task group called Taffy 3. Only hours before, these same vessels had come under withering gunfire from the Japanese Navy. The escort carrier USS St. Lo is one of the few ships of Taffy 3 not hit during the battle. Planes are now returning to St. Lo from the morning's combat and are quickly moved below decks for rearming and refueling. No one can imagine what is about to befall them. Orville Bethard is a 21-year-old electrician's mate on the St. Lo. I've never heard of a kamikaze. I've heard of bombers and all those kind of things, but somebody purposely uh, doing this didn't even occur to me. 10.45 a.m. The kamikazes spot the unsuspecting American ships. They climb quickly to 5,000 feet, positioning for a high-speed dive. The Japanese pilots select their targets, the vulnerable flight decks of the escort carriers. Escort carriers became the target of choice due to the fact that they had a thin wooden flight deck that could be penetrated by incoming kamikazes and their bombs. At 10.49, Lieutenant Seiki sees his opening. He rocks his wings to signal the attack. Diving on the USS White Plains, Seki is hit by flak and veers towards the St. Lo. Well, we've been bombed before and everything, you know, all over this way, but this guy was low. It was heading for us like he was going to make a landing on our flight deck. Somebody behind me opened up with a 20 millimeter gun. And it may have hit him, but it didn't stop him. 
Captain Francis McKenna orders full right rudder, but the 10,000-ton vessel is slow to respond. This thing's doing 300 miles an hour, and he's coming in in a matter of seconds. Now, you can try to turn the ship, but there's not much you can do about it. At 10.53, Secchi sweeps in over the stern, then dives onto St. Lowe's flight deck. I didn't get the effect of the explosion, but I did get the fireball. And it comes sweeping over my where I was located. I ducked real low and it went skinning on over and out. Seki's armor-piercing bomb has sliced through the wooden flight deck and detonated below. What happens next is aircraft start exploding in the hangar deck, and each explosion begets another. One explosion will will, will set off a torpedo over here. Will set off um, some exposed fuel over here, and before you know it, half the hangar deck is ablaze. Men are burning. It's a horrific, frightening scene. Valiant crewmen try to contain the raging inferno, but just seven minutes after the first kamikaze hit, St. Lowe is in shambles. Captain McKenna orders the abandoned ship, at which point the lines go overboard and men start, start jumping into the sea, swimming away from the ship, trying to gain some distance before the ship goes down and sucks them under with it. At 11.20 a.m., an eighth explosion. The aircraft bomb magazine detonates, ripping apart the St. Low. I could feel a big concussion from that in the water. And I turned around and I looked and I watched it then. The ship had turned about like that and was going down stern first. I don't know how many live people were still on there. And I was thinking, well, I was thinking, there goes my home. At 11.25, the once proud ship slips beneath the surface. Of a crew of over 850, 114 are lost. USS St. Lowe is the first American ship sunk by kamikazes. A hideous scenario that will be repeated nearly 3,000 times before the war's end claiming 5,000 lives. The idea for suicide attacks was first considered nearly 20 months earlier, in the wake of Japan's humiliating loss of Guadalcanal in February 1943. The kamikaze program was born of desperation when they realized that there was not much they could do against the overwhelming strength being deployed by the Americans. That wasn't much they could do in the, in the conventional, traditional sense. The concept was originally rejected as defeatist, but with the Allied invasion of the Philippines, the decision is made to unleash the suicide weapon. The goal is to inflict sufficient casualties to destroy the Americans' will to fight. The new strategy is called TOKO. They refer to the tactic as tokubetsu kogeki, uh, which means uh, literally translated special attack. Vice Admiral Takajiro Onishi is charged with implementing toko operations immediately. He enlists volunteers from the 201st Naval Air Group in the Philippines. There's no time for specialized training. Many of the first volunteers are dive bomber pilots. It is hoped that their experience in near vertical dives will translate into the TOKO mission. The high command understands that turning sons of Japan into human bombs will have to be carefully sold to the people. They skillfully manipulate Japan's ancient history to envelop TOKO in the idealized warrior tradition of the samurai and their Bushido code. In the so-called 
code of the warrior or Bushido, there was no tradition or heritage of organized suicide tactics. If there was any kind of codification of suicide in this so-called Bushido, it was to kill yourself rather than being captured. Uh, there was never anything in it about uh, making a suicide attack. The success of the initial kamikaze mission on October 25th, 1944, unleashes a tidal wave of attacks. The Navy and Army High Command draft inexperienced pilots into practically any flyable airplane. By the time of the Okinawa invasion in April 1945, Massive kamikaze raids are bringing a glimmer of hope to Japan's desperate situation. It spreads the idea that a single man, a single aircraft, can trade itself for a U.S. carrier, which is truly a glorious sacrifice for the emperor. April 16, 1945. The destroyer USS Laffey, accompanied by support ships LCS-51 and 116, is patrolling waters 50 miles north of Okinawa. The ship is on radar picket duty, a new defensive tactic that positions a ring of destroyers around the main invasion force to create an early warning system against incoming aircraft. Laffey is manning station number one, the closest to Japan. The last four destroyers to patrol this area were slammed by kamikazes. Ari Futridis is a 19-year-old quartermaster on Laffey. We knew that being the first in the line of defense was, was uh, dangerous, but we didn't realize to what extent. At 7.44 a.m., radar picks up a solitary Val dive bomber six miles out, approaching off the port bow. Laffey's five-inch guns quickly open fire. At three miles, the Val jettisons its bomb and turns away. Probably came in just to look over the situation and, and then took off. Then, at 8.29 a.m., a swarm of 50 Japanese planes appears on the horizon. The attackers circle ominously, like vultures. The USS Laffey is about to face the most unrelenting kamikaze attack in history. April 16, 1945, 50 kamikazes surround the destroyer USS Laffey. The swarm includes Val and Judy dive bombers and Cape torpedo planes. Older aircraft equipped for suicide attack. These were outmoded aircraft. They could be loaded with explosives. They were relatively easy to fly and stable platforms for doing what they had to do, which is to aim at a ship and try to, try to hit it. Al Doris watches the terrifying procession from his 40 millimeter gun mount. Well, they were just about every place you looked. You know, you could see a Japanese plane. Suddenly, four valves break formation and bear down on Laffey. They were coming in low on the water, and somebody on our gun said, well, here they come. They're, they're coming now. Two head for the starboard bow. Captain Julius Becton orders Laffey to come about hard left 30 degrees to bring all his guns broadside to the attackers. Laffey unleashes an anti-aircraft barrage. First, the main battery, five-inch radar-directed guns. And then they get in a little closer than the 40s. And 
I get a little closer, then the 20 millimeters will start rattling at him. We just try to stop him as best we could. Laffy splashes the first two attackers, but the other two valves wheel around to come in from the stern. One valve sheds pieces of fuselage until its fixed landing gear catches the water. Tracers converge on the second valve. Laffy is barely spared a moment's respite before a Judy screams in from 90 degrees to starboard. Judy's are a fast dive bomber, top speed 340 miles per hour. But this one's heading in at a poor attack angle. All of Laffy's guns can train their fire on the kamikaze. But immediately, another Judy barrels in on the opposite side. The destroyer's top speed is 35 knots, and it can turn sharply. Captain Beckton orders 30 degrees hard right rudder. This diving Judy was also strafing with its guns, trying to take out personnel on the command bridge. And so we had briefly a two-way gunnery duel between an oncoming kamikaze and the defending gunners. The Judy is no match for Laffey's main battery. The aircraft disintegrates, but its bomb detonates in the water, spewing killing shrapnel over exposed areas of the ship. Planes are coming in from every angle using specialized tactics developed over months of experience. A kamikaze attack isn't exactly an easy thing to do. You have about 500 kilos of explosives on board, and you are going at exceedingly fast speeds from very high up. To actually hit the target, it's very difficult. The Japanese have determined that the most effective attacks are from extremely high or extremely low angles. In the high angle attack, the kamikazes approach at 20,000 feet, angle 20 degrees down to 5,000 feet, then a steep 50 degree high speed dive. For the low angle attack, the kamikazes approach below 40 feet to hide under radar. When they near the target, the pilot pulls up to 1,500 feet for the final plunge, relying on speed and gravity to reach the target, even if his aircraft is hit. The ideal TOKO mission can muster enough kamikazes to use all approach tactics together. Precisely what Laffey is facing now. At 8.39 a.m., a Val approaches from the port side, directly amidships. Laffey maneuvers violently to throw off the pilot's aim. Laffey now presents a smaller target. The ship is 377 feet long, but only 41 feet wide. This did have an effect, apparently, on the Val pilot because he was having to constantly change his aim in order to keep his aircraft heading for the mass of the ship. Eventually, because of the swing of the Laffey, the Val was now coming in from almost dead astern. It's as if Laffey is in a dogfight with the Kamikaze. Triple A hits home. But the Val's momentum carries him in. It's a glancing blow, but the plane's ruptured gas tanks spew a lethal arc of combustible fuel. Then, a ninth kamikaze bores in. The Val approaches at wavetop level, too low an angle for the main gun battery.
the plane rips into a 20 millimeter gun mount amidships, killing three men. Another Val approaches dead astern, obscured by the billowing smoke. The carnage reaches below decks. Crewmen enveloped in flames race topside. Sailors aboard LCS-51 steaming nearby witness the terrible scene. Several men who were working below decks came roaring out of there and jumped over the side, just full of flames. We picked two of them up. It was, it was nasty. It was nasty. At 8.47, 17 minutes into the attack, gun mount 53 takes a direct hit. Val's engine lodges in the five-inch gun, knocking it out. Aviation fuel engulfs the gun mount and ignites. There were 14 men inside that gun mount at that time, and six of them were killed. It seemed like a constant pattern of attack. In fact, at one point, I remember thinking to myself, my God, will this never end? In the furious action, one of the kamikazes swings past the Laffy and targets LCS-51, steaming off the port side. One of the planes came in maybe 10 feet off the water. And of course, our guns on that side of the ship were all awning. Some of us, one of us, hit the bomb about 20, 30 feet from the ship. The bomb detonated and blew the plane to smithereens, the engine right into the side of our ship. My spotter, who was in with the director tub with me, put his arm up to shield his face. He put his arm up and was all over. He had three or four aluminum rivets in his arm that came from the plane. Back on Laffey, Fires are blazing on the fantail. Captain Beckton is forced to cut his speed. If you run too fast, you're going to fan the flames and make them stronger. But if you go too slow, then the enemy's going to be able to hit you better. So what he would do, he would slow down so they could fight the fire. And as the enemy got closer, he would increase his speed. But another Val is lining up high astern, drawn to the raging fires like a shark to blood. The ship takes evasive action and swings hard to port. This Val is making a bomb run. Kamikaze formations were often accompanied by conventional bombers. A single 500-pound bomb hits the destroyer, jamming the rudder 26 degrees to port. Having the rudders jam permanently in this location meant that the ship could only steam in a left-hand circle. Captain Beckton could come up with variations such as changing engine speed in order to broaden or tighten the turn, but still, this was a severe limitation on his defensive abilities. Fires are raging. Steering is damaged. Laffey is fading fast. April 16, 1945. USS Laffey is being hammered by a swarm of 50 kamikazes. Now, four FM-2 Wildcats from Navy Squadron BC-94, flying off the carrier Shamrock Bay, are vectored in to try to save the ship. Flight leader Carl Riemann has witnessed other kamikaze attacks and understands the urgency of his mission. I've seen them come down and hit the different ships. And boy, I'm telling you, when they hit a ship, she blew. Riemann wings in and sizes up the situation. The 
odds are 50 against four. The FM2s only carry 1,600 rounds of ammo, about 45 seconds worth. His big enemy is the time. How is it gonna be well managed so that he gets bullets on target, does not waste bullets, does not waste energy? Riemann must use the speed and agility of the FM2 to counter the long odds. The FM2 is an updated version of the venerable F4F Wildcat. The new airplane has a more powerful 1,260 horsepower engine. It can easily outfly the obsolete planes attacking the Laffey. Riemann and his wingman, Dick Collier, climb 500 feet above the kamikaze formation, target a Val, and quickly dive in from the side. Riemann hurtles in, aiming his 450 caliber machine guns. But his wingman unknowingly drifts into the line of fire. Collier, he was right on my wing, and he got in between us. So uh, I couldn't shoot after that, because I'd have shot Collier. Collier gets the kill. Riemann quickly lines up behind another valve, opens fire, and explodes the enemy's wing tanks. We were on so fast, they didn't have time to really do anything. They had no place to go, except down. There are still over 40 kamikazes attacking Laffey. The massive formations ensure some suicide planes will get through. It's like a swarm of mosquitoes. You can kill a lot of them, you can kill them easily, but there are enough mosquitoes, one's going to bite you. Horrified at the carnage below, Riemann singles out a kamikaze for payback. His tracers light up the enemy's canopy, killing the pilot. I watched him just slump over and bing, and he went. These kamikaze pilots are little more than trainees. Most of Japan's experienced aviators have been lost during three years of war. They were given two days of takeoff training, two days of formation flying, and three days of actually how to dive in to destroy an enemy ship. These kids have been trained for a week, and now they're going out there, and they're basically becoming a human bomb. Two kamikazes break through the fighter screen and pitch over into a death dive on the Laffey. Well, when they got in close enough, you could see the pilot sitting right in the cockpit. And he's not looking one way or the other. He's looking right straight ahead. And he's aiming that plane right at you. You can't imagine what goes through, what goes through somebody's mind that does that. Both planes hit their mark. Pressing the attack, Riemann sweeps behind a Cape torpedo plane and smokes the engine. But he's used the last of his ammo. Well, if I'd had more ammo, I could have shot down more airplanes. In the vernacular, I was just totally pissed off because <laughs> there was a lot more to shoot at. Riemann makes diving passes at kamikazes, forcing some to break off their attacks. But finally, low on fuel, his flight must return to the Shamrock Bay. We shot down six airplanes, and we had six airplanes that didn't hit the Laffey. 
And we're just only sorry we couldn't keep all of them off of her. She was burning. Burning bad. I thought she was gone. Laffy has now been struck by five kamikazes and taken three bomb hits. The skipper sent me down to get an assessment of the damage back aft. And then I saw what these planes had done. I saw the gun mounts. I saw that there were fires. I saw a lot of human carnage. Uh, I think I might have been in a state of shock. Uh, when you see things like that. When a crewman suggests throwing in the towel, Captain Beckton responds with indignation. I will not abandon ship as long as a single gun can fire. Then, just as all seems lost, a dozen American Corsair fighters roar in. They are the last hope for the burning Laffey. USS Laffey has taken repeated kamikaze hits. And at least 30 Japanese planes are still waiting to pounce. Now, not a moment too soon, Marine Corps F-4U Corsairs scream in. We looked up and saw them. Well, that took a lot off of us because they kept them busy from then on. The F-4U Corsair was one of the most advanced naval fighters of the Pacific War. Its distinctive bent wing derived from the clearance needed from its huge 13-foot propeller. The shape also reduced aerodynamic drag. Corsair had a clear advantage over any Japanese aircraft. High speed, tough, very maneuverable, take a lot of punishment. Time and again, the Corsair pilots risked their own lives, chasing the kamikazes down through Laffey's unceasing anti-aircraft fire. One is hot on the tail of a KI-43 Oscar. This Japanese plane was coming in, and they get Corsair come up underneath of him. Tried to raise him up to get him away from the ship. The Oscar shears off the port yard arm. The Corsair hits the ship's radar antenna and careens away, badly damaged. The courageous American pilot manages to bail out. Suddenly, a bow looms menacingly towards the bridge, Ari Futridi's battle station. It was very vivid in my mind. There was a huge bomb under his belly. And as he approached, the bomb got bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and I really felt at that point that that was going to be a statistic. But at the last second, gun mount 52 traverses from port to starboard. He hit the, the plane directly on the nose and it disintegrated. That I remember very vividly. Finally, the 22nd and last attacker, a Judy, streaks in. A Corsair blasts the kamikaze before it could strike the ship. Now, only the roar of the Corsair's 2,000 horsepower engines fill the sky. After 80 minutes of non-stop combat, six kamikaze strikes and four bomb hits, incredibly, Laffy is still afloat. Of a crew of 355, 32 men have died, and 71 more are wounded. But the destroyer 
will survive to fight another day. I lost a lot of good friends, and a lot of the guys were wounded, and, and it was, made you think how lucky you were not to get a scratch. I think there were several factors involved in our survival. I always point to the competency of our commanding officer and the way he maneuvered the ship during the attack. There was the combat air patrol, which helped us out. Our crew it was a brave crew, especially the gunners. And finally, I am convinced in my own mind that uh, we had a little help from above. The Okinawa campaign saw many brutal kamikaze raids of the type endured by Laffey. It also marked the brief appearance of the most insidious suicide weapon of World War II, called Oka. April 12, 1945, radar picket station 14 off Okinawa. Destroyer Mannert L. Abeli is battling fires after being hit by a zero kamikaze. The plane went through the deck and down and broke both our shafts, our screws on the ship, which put us about dead in the water. Just five minutes after the kamikaze strike, three Japanese Betty bombers are spotted inbound from the north at 20,000 feet. What the Americans don't know is that suspended within the open bomb bay of each Betty is an appalling new suicide weapon a single-seat, rocket-powered, piloted bomb developed by the Japanese Navy. It's called Oka, or Cherry Blossom. The Americans derisively nickname the weapon Baka, or Idiot. But they will discover to their horror that the piloted missile is virtually unstoppable. April 12, 1945. Three Betty bombers carrying Oka Kamikaze rocket planes approach the crippled destroyer Mannert L. Abeli. Inside one of the bombers, Lieutenant Saburo Dohi is awakened from a nap and climbs down into the Oka's cockpit. The human guidance system is now in place. The Oka is released. Its plunge begins as an unpowered glide one minute from impact. Lieutenant Dohi kicks in his solid rocket boosters. The Oka makes its final sprint to the Aboli at over 500 miles per hour. Able seaman Jim Morris spots something he's never seen before. Somebody said, look at that, and I look up, and that's when I saw the Baca bomb coming in. It was coming in from our starboard quarter. And I watched that rascal, I didn't, to me it looked like a flying torpedo. I had no idea what it was. The destroyer's five inch mounts can't move. 40 millimeter and 20 millimeter guns open fire at the mysterious incoming object. The ship's midsection is obliterated. When it hit, that whole ship just shook all over. And that's when I went over the side. It went down to two pieces. The stern came down and the bow came down. Like that. Within three minutes, Mannert L. Abeli vanishes. 79 men are lost. The Oka has left its murderous calling card. The piloted bomb program, known as the Divine Thunder God Corps, was approved by the Japanese Navy in August 1944. Newly minted pilot Hideo Suzuki was asked to volunteer. 
The commander described the weapon as most innovative, most powerful, and damaging, but requires our absolute sacrifice. I knew all along that a death awaits war-going pilots one way or another. If my trusted commander is asking for men, then I will volunteer. The Oka is ingeniously simple. Aluminum fuselage, wooden wings, and directly in front of the pilot, 2,600 pounds of high explosive, five times the amount carried by the Zero that sank the St. Lowe. Each Oka volunteer is allowed one risky orientation flight in an unpowered, unarmed Oka. First, I fell just like a bomb, and I had to gain momentum before the flight controls would operate and I could start flying. The training Oka had no rockets, so we had to glide in. In a real operation, I would fire three rockets to strike the target. Having survived his training drop, Suzuki is ready to fulfill his destiny. If I am to die, I will die the most effective, most glorious death by inflicting the greatest damage on our enemy. Not far from the Able, another of Suzuki's cohorts hurtles towards the picket destroyer USS Stanley. On board the ship, radar operator Irvin Brewer spots the strange flying object. It was on the deck when I saw it. I mean, it was right off the water, just as low as it could get. I just hit the deck and started praying. The Oka impacts the starboard bow, five feet above the waterline. I don't know if I saw it the instant it hit, but I sure as hell felt it. The missile's armor-piercing nose section punches right through Stanley's steel bow plates and out the other side. They plotted that thing at 500 miles an hour, and we knew it had to be some jet-propelled thing because, I mean, we didn't have anything to go that fast. Within minutes, another Oka bores in. Stanley's guns are blazing. The pilot, perhaps wounded or killed, releases pressure on the stick for a brief instant. The Oka rises slightly, just enough to miss the ship. Unlike the Abeling, the Stanley suffers only minimal damage with three crewmen wounded. Ultimately, the Oka program never lived up to its lethal potential. The bomber transports were easy prey for American fighters, and only seven American ships were damaged by Okas during the war. Hideo Suzuki was never selected for his glorious death. Although the kamikazes arrived too late to be militarily significant, they exacted a terrible cost. Some 2,800 kamikaze attacks killed nearly 5,000 Americans and wounded 4,800 more. Ominously, Japan had reserved more than 5,000 suicide aircraft to be used against the expected invasion of the home islands, a gruesome scenario that would have magnified the immense human toll of the Kamikaze.